Welcome back to WCB Jazz Vinyl. So for those of you who have been following my channel over the last week, you'll realize we're in Record Store Day season. So Record Store Day is coming up on April 20th, and I've been tackling some of those releases one by one. So we started off with Art Tatum. Uh, we moved on to, it was a short summer, Charlie Brown. I think most recently it was the Youssef Latif Atlantis uh, Lullaby release. And today what we're gonna talk about is the Mal Waldron and Steve Lacey title, The Mighty Warriors. Um, so again, being put out for Record Store Day, it's also going to be available digitally and, and on CD the following Friday, but I do think the vinyl release is specific to Record Store Day. So uh, without further ado, if this is your first time here, go ahead and hit subscribe. I, um, I post reviews of a ton of music, both vintage pressings and modern stuff, talk about release calendars, um, a lot of history involved in uh, usually in, in, in my discussions. If that's the sort of thing that interests you, then uh, then go ahead and hit subscribe. Otherwise, you can follow me over on Instagram as well. I'm at what underscore can underscore brown. And otherwise, without further ado, let's just get into it. All right, so let's take a look. So this is the Mighty Warriors. This is a double LP being put out on 180 gram. The content here has never been released before. So this is not a reissue. I don't even think it's been available digitally in the past. Uh, in terms of how they got uh, across, the, the, how they came across this material, I believe that it was something like Barney Weiland's son, Patrick, had the original tapes. Uh, and so what they did is they, uh, they, they transferred from those original tapes. It was mastered by Matthew Luthens at the Mastering Lab. Um, and, and otherwise, I mean, this is this is what the release looks like. It is a gatefold. It does come with a great um, a great booklet as well, as is typical with a lot of these uh, these resonance releases. They typically do a good job in terms of bringing in some of the history as well as uh, recollections or reminiscing from some of the musicians that were on here or some of the musicians who played with the musicians who were on here. Um, so otherwise, in terms of in terms of what this recording is, well, it was a live concert. So it was recorded in Antwerp, Belgium in 1995, and that particular concert was part of Mal Waldron's 70, uh, 70th birthday sort of celebration of concerts. So it wasn't just one, I think there were three. There was another concert that was done maybe the prior day that I, that I believe was a, um, was a duet between Max Roach and, uh, and Mal Waldron. Apparently the two were great friends. This though uh, really does just capture this, this one day, this one concert, and the lineup includes not only Mal Waldron and Steve Lacey, but you also have Andrew Cyril and Reggie Workman. So really an all-star lineup all around. Um, that being said, it wasn't like these musicians hadn't performed together before. Uh, in fact, the first time that Steve Lacey and Mal Waldron performed together was in 1958 at the Five Spot. Um, they were also both under contract with Prestige and their sort of their sub-label New Jazz at the time, and you can find them both playing together on Steve Lacey's album Reflections, uh, which is a fantastic album that was put out on New Jazz in 1959. Um, later on, Lacey wasn't really recording that much with a piano player, um, and yet he always had sort of an affinity for Thelonious Monk's music and, uh, and played Monk's music a lot with his own group. He even had albums that were sort of focused strictly on Thelonious Monk's compositions. So between, between Mal Waldron, a piano player, and, uh, and Steve Lacey, just simply somebody who had a lot of passion for Thelonious Monk, I think they shared a lot in common. They both are very familiar with the uh, sort of the complexity of Monk's tunes. And in fact, they play a few on this album as well. So I forgot to mention, the album's title, The Mighty Warriors, is a reference to apparently Cyril's statement during the concert that M.W. Mal Waldron stands for Mighty Warrior. And so um, you actually do get some color around that in the included booklet, which also again has reflections from some of the other musicians uh, included as well. But anyway, speaking of Monk, this album, as I mentioned, includes a few Monk tunes. So it includes Epistrophe, which is a track that Lacey had been known for playing for, you know, over the years. Um, it also includes a rendition of Monk's Dream, which is, uh, which is obviously by Monk as well. The other three tracks on this include three originals. I'll say three originals by, by Waldron. Um, two of them are kind of in a medley, but, but still they're, they're like separate kind of things. There's also an original by Reggie Workman on here, and then there's one by Steve Lacey as well. So all together, it's a variety of either originals by this particular lineup or their originals by, uh, by Monk. So um, let's, let's kind of now talk a little bit about the music as well as how it sounds, because I think those two things are the most important topics just generally with any release. But, but I feel like um, those are the two things that are, I think are gonna be important for 
everyone out there to determine in terms of whether this is something that they are going to want to pick up and that they're going to want to enjoy. All right, so as far as the performance goes here, um, the, the performance of this music, you know it's going to be amazing based on who it is we have playing here. Um, what to expect, though, in terms of style, I'm actually going to have to be careful to describe at the very least so that I don't dishonor Mal Waldron's preference for calling his music simply music and not any other kind of genre-based descriptor or box to put it in. Yusef Latif was another musician who was very sort of specific with how he wanted his music to be referred to, and in Waldron's case, simply music. No other classifier. He did not like jazz. He did not like black classical music, etc. Um, so, so I'm going to try to, um, you know, explain what this is while also being sensitive to that. So I will say that, that technically this is not a straight ahead album in terms of compositional structure that you might expect with say, you know, a melody followed by trading of solos and then back to the melody and then out. Um, the pieces here rarely have a constant time signature or key signature. And I would say that there are less constraints than say what was being played if you're familiar with music and you appreciate music that was being performed in the 1950s. Um, it's also not what I would call free either, at least not entirely. So the Workman piece, Reggie Workman's piece titled Variation of Three, does not have a, an established time signature at all. But otherwise, across the tracks, there is still generally some structure here. It isn't always spontaneous improvisation. It's just that there's a there's a complexity of composition here and a complexity to the musicians playing that I think gives you a really good sense of just how virtuosic they are, but also how well they perform together. Um, so in that way, I think that this is very much ensemble playing, and that is really the the spotlight is on that ensemble and sort of the, uh, the sort of how the musicians feed off each other and how the music evolves. Um, I think I think that if you if you recorded this concert, if you had them play the exact same tunes in consecutive days, you'd get very different sort of experiences and very different um, sort of uh, things that would emerge out of the uh, out of out of how these these musicians are playing together. Um, but, you know, also do remember that because we have several monk standards here, there are some melodies across a few of the pieces that are going to help ground you if you're looking for something that, say, is a little bit more recognizable, or if you're interested in music that simply you can follow from a structural standpoint. You know, one of the things that I would say that is notable about this album, actually, and especially that I think helps give you a little bit more information around exactly what I mean when I say that some of this piece, some of these pieces are a little bit more complex, this is long format stuff. So if, if I'm contrasting it with the Yusef Latif release that I discussed in my last video where I kind of said, oh, there's something for everyone here. It bridges genres. Not so much here. This is a little bit more focused and again, just a little bit more adventurous. So, you know, if I'm looking at even just the track listing, first of all, you get you get um, 24 minutes of music on each side. So the fact that this is a double disc, they filled every second of that double disc, 24 minutes at least of music on each side. In fact, I'm just looking at this now. It's like, um, yeah, it's like 24 minutes on side A, 25 minutes on side B, 25 minutes on side C, and like 24 minutes on side D. Um, and in, across that, there's only one, two, three, four, five, six pieces. So what that means tangibly is you're getting, you're only getting one, I'll say relatively short piece at about six minutes. The others are 12, 12 and a half minutes, 17 minutes, 24 minute pieces. So it, they really allow the musicians to, to stretch and explore and have a lot of that interaction and have these pieces kind of evolve organically rather than them being so sort of composed or, um, you know, sort of uh, rigid in terms of structure. So I guess, you know, a question always with, with music that's a little bit more complex is whether you need to be a musician in order to appreciate it. And I think a lot of folks who um, are really passionate about uh, sort of free or music would argue that no, it's about how it makes you feel, and um, and and I guess I, I would just say that I think that um, you know somebody with a music background and somebody without a music background is just always going to approach music in in different ways. But I think I think regardless of whether you have a music background or not, that there's a lot to appreciate here and there's a lot to keep your attention. For me, um, almost every piece is a highlight because it gives you something different. Now, keep in mind, I do have a music background, and so I tend to approach, I don't want to say I, I approach music from more of an analytic standpoint, even though it comes across that way in a lot of videos because I'm having to explain it and I'm having to explain my thought process. And it's very difficult for me to just come on here and say, oh, it makes you feel good. Um, I'm, I'm always looking for words that help describe it because my goal here is to help you understand what to expect. 
Um, it's not to say that I don't appreciate music from more of a cerebral standpoint. So, uh, like I said, I think every piece is a highlight. I really love the opener, um, which is titled What It Is. Um, the solos towards the end of this piece are especially amazing and especially bass and drums. That drum work, when it's alone, uh, Surreal's uh, drum work, when it's alone, gives you a sense of just how beautiful this recording is sonically. Um, I will say that across this piece, there is some non-traditional drumming in terms of the sounds that Surreal gets from his kit, especially on that uh, previously mentioned piece, uh, Variation of Three, where he's playing like cowbell, he's playing like the sides of the snare, probably his snare stand. He's getting like a lot of different kind of, um, you know, sort of interesting things to, uh, to I don't know, allow you to kind of focus on that help create this sort of texture of the piece. And texture, I feel like is, I think is a great way to describe any piece that's a little bit less traditional or let or has less constraints in terms of uh, in terms of established melody and and rhythm is you want to kind of get swept up into this aura or texture that the uh, that the music conveys and I think that um, I think that when the pieces do deviate a little bit from you know from some of this uh, some of these things that ground you more typically like a time signature a key signature that that um, that it's nice to have that uh, that texture that almost grounds you because it uh, it brings you into the music. Um, so, so that's what I would say uh, generally about this music. Again, there, there are some pieces that are going to help ground you because they're going to be recognizable. Even in the originals, there are, there, some of them do have an established melody that, you know, after solos you're brought back to, but also know that there's some that's a little bit more, um, you know, I guess just, just less constraints. So to state the obvious, this album sounds like a modern recording. Um, especially compared to some of the other archival releases being put out by Elemental as well as Resonance for Record Store Day. Now, that's going to sound obvious because, well, it is more modern, and yet I hesitate to say that as well because 1995 just feels like, to me, like it was recorded yesterday because that was very much during my lifetime. And yet 1995 was also admittedly almost 30 years ago. But, but suffice it to say, uh, this was recorded quite well, actually. So people who listen, and I know that there's a lot of you out there because everybody's going to say it's about the music, right? But here's the thing. Not... It's, it's not always just about the music for a lot of people. It, it often is about um, it, it often is about the sonics and how well it's recorded because you could say that it's about the music. Then you listen to something that was recorded in the 1940s in like a jazz of the Philharmonic uh, sort of session, and you can you can you know objectively say that music that was recorded in in that kind of format versus something that was really done really well in a studio that there's going to be a difference. You're going to have a preference for what you want to hear. Um, so what I will say for those folks who are interested in the sound quality. Um, there is a lot to enjoy here in terms of sonic detail, separation of instruments. Um, the drums are very crisp and distinct with a really nice sustain. The balance across all the musicians though is very nice as well. Um, with all music, with all instruments, not just audible, but again, but again, very well balanced. I do think that this this uh, double album is one of those situations where if you've if you've prioritized having a nice setup in your home. Uh, in terms of speakers, in terms of, you know, stylus and all these things. Um, I, I think that the Sonics here are a particular strength of the album and not just not just adequate or even adequate for a live performance. Like I'm talking like the sustain from the crash cymbals just really lingers. Like you can hear every piece of the kit that Cyril is touching. It's never muddy or indistinct. Lacey's horn has a lot of like breath noise to it. This is just overall like a real treat for those of you out there who are audiophiles and who not only appreciate the music, but also appreciate when it's very well recorded. This is a very well recorded album. And I think out of all the record store day releases that I've been able to preview thus far, this probably is the most audiophile in sound out of all of them. So I guess the best way to sum up this, because, um, you know, I, do I think that this double LP is for everyone? I, I don't actually. Um, I think that, um, don't get me wrong, I get a lot of enjoyment out of this. I love each of these musicians. I love the music here, and I love how well it sounds. But just know that the music is a little bit more adventurous than um, if you're used to 1950s, 1960s, like Blue Note stuff. It is more adventurous. It's definitely, you can definitely see and hear how these musicians have progressed over the years. 
Um, and so you kind of have to be prepared for that. At the same time, again, there, there's still a lot to ground you. It's not just free, spontaneous kind of stuff. Um, but you know, but it, but again, it also is that kind of audiophile element. And and I personally think, you know, listen, like I don't have, you know, I don't have the greatest setup in the world. I'm still in the process of getting a new turntable. I'm still trying things out. A lot of people will say that I shouldn't be matching these Kef LS 50s with this Mac equipment. Like, you know, listen, I'm not that, uh, that audiophile who spends tens of thousands of dollars on equipment. And yet when I listened to this album in this room, I was like, wow, this is like really, really well recorded. So I think if, if you're able to appreciate kind of these two things, right? This, um, this more adventurous music that's, um, you know, coupled with the fact that it, that, you know, it's going to sound just really, really good. That that's kind of the sweet spot, I guess, that of, of, you know, for, for you out there who might be looking at this, at this release and saying, is this something that I should buy? That's, that's kind of what you should expect with it. All right, so that's it. Again, I hope this is helpful for people to uh, to get a sense of what to expect. This is the release coming out on Record Store Day, and um, I guess um, stay tuned for for a couple of more videos that I'm going to be do doing leading up to April 20th, because I am trying to tackle everything that I've been obviously fortunate enough to to receive a copy of. I've been trying to tackle and provide a more in depth video to give folks an idea, because listen. We can't just buy everything on Record Store Day. I get it. Everybody has to prioritize what they're going to go after, um, both in terms of price as well as in terms of availability. So hope this is helpful. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.